In the course of our personal ministry, I receive a lot of letters. I walked back to my office one day at Telba School of Theology and I noticed this huge envelope sitting in my door. And I pulled it out and uh, noticed immediately that there were a lot of pages here, like 36. And it started out, Dear Neil. <laughs> and all I could think of was, oh no, a 36 page letter. So I thought I'd read it to you. It goes like this. Dear Neil, it's Thanksgiving time, and do I ever have a lot to be thankful for? I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. Enclosed, you will find 10,000 thank yous. <laughs> That's what it is. It's a marvelous computer age we're living in. He just pushed the button, went off and had a cup of coffee, and gave me 10,000 thank yous. Now let me go on to say what he said. I'm sending them to you for your ministry, your commitment to proclaim the truth, through seminary classes, books, conferences, counseling, etc., and determination to spine long hours, heavy demands, spiritual attacks, and disparaging remarks, even from believers, I'm afraid. He said, I know that you will immediately credit the source of all your success, gifts, and abilities to our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm thanking him too, constantly. Chalk up another pastor, delivered from the terrible bondage of deception to freedom in Christ. Neil, I could match story for story, personal testimony for personal testimony, gross experience for gross experience with many of the letters that you share. I'm sparing you the vile details as you've heard enough, but if you could use a more detailed version to help another defeated pastor, I'd be happy to share my specific freedom from sexual sins, eating disorders, inability to read and concentrate on the Word of God, etc. Well, he attended one of our conferences and found his own personal freedom in Christ. But as I was sharing some of those responses that we're getting, pastors were asking me, what are you going to do with those? And I said, well, I'm, what I'm doing with them. Well, that really prompted me, uh, since it's such a powerful thing to hear from people, the transition that's taking place in their life and their own personal freedom. After all, we overcome, do we not, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony? So encouraged by that, we put together the book, Release from Bondage. And, uh, which are case studies, people hearing it from their perspective, anywhere from sexual disorders to eating disorders to bondage to the occult and whatever else. But the answer for all of them was still the same. I'd like to share another letter. This one came from a pastor's wife. If she walked in tonight, you'd take a look at her. She looked like the most put-together person here on the outside. I spent a couple of times with her, and this is what she wrote me. She said, having literally grown up in the church and having been a pastor's wife for 25 years, everyone thought I was as put together on the inside as I was on the outside. On the contrary, she said, I knew that there was no infrastructure on the inside and often wondered when the weight of trying to hold myself together would cause my life to fall apart and come crumbling down. It seemed as if sheer determination was the only thing that kept me going. When I left your office last Thursday, it was a beautiful, crystal clear day with the snow visible on the mountains, and, a, and it felt like a film had been lifted from my eyes. The tape player was playing a piano arrangement of It Is Well With My Soul. The words of the song fairly exploded in my mind with the realization that it was well in my soul for the first time in years. The next day at work, my immediate response to How Are You Today was, I'm doing great, how about you? In the past, I would have mumbled something about being almost alive. The next comment I heard was, boy, something must have happened to you yesterday. She said, I've, I've heard the same songs, read the same Bible verses as before, but it is as if I'm uh, hearing it for the first time, like it's totally new. There's an underlying joy and peace in the midst of the same circumstances that used to bring defeat and discouragement. For the first time, I've wanted to read my Bible and pray. It's hard to contain myself. I want to shout from the rooftops what's taking place in my life. But my real desire is for my life itself to do the shouting. Already the deceiver has tried to plant thoughts in my mind that this won't last, that it's just another gimmick that won't work. The difference is, is that now I know those are lies from Satan and not the truth. What a difference freedom in Christ makes. Well, what a difference it makes for all of us, right? Does God want you free? Of course he does. He went to the cross for your freedom. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. From, uh, from the law, from our flesh, but also from the devil. Now, how do we explain that? Am I some great anointed counselor, some gifted person? No. 
No, I would totally deny that. That is not true at all. I'm not the deliverer. The deliverer has already come. And we are seeing people all over the world of having that kind of results. But how do we explain that? Well, to do that, we need to look at two issues. Uh, one is the whole area of mental health. What is mental health? Well, from a secular perspective, mental health is typically defined as, number one, being in touch with reality, and number two, relatively free of anxiety. Now look at that just for a moment. Because I want to submit to you that anybody caught in a spiritual attack would fail on both counts. The first one. Suppose somebody would uh, come into a counselor and say that I'm hearing voices or I saw something in my room and that person didn't hear the voices or didn't see the appearance in the room. What would they conclude? They would conclude that that person is out of touch with reality. Well, I'm suggesting that the one that may be out of touch with reality may not be the counselee. It may be the counselor. Because there are people all over this world who are hearing voices. And not only that, but seeing things, experiencing phenomena, coming up against something that is not necessarily observed by somebody else. The reason is, is because it's not out there. It's right here. Now, we are clearly told in the Bible, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, that the Holy Spirit explicitly says that in latter days, people will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceiving spirits and literally teachings of demons. What I'm suggesting to you is, is that sometimes what is perceived as mental illness may be nothing more than a battle going on for their mind. I have counseled hundreds of people who have very sheepishly, but admittedly, that tell me that they are hearing voices, that they're struggling with their thought lives. And I have no exceptions to this day. If it hasn't been multiple personality disorder, it's been demonic. It usually takes us about three or four hours to free them of that kind of an influence in a quiet, controlled, very compassionate way, I hope. We've researched 1,725 professing Christian kids in Southern California. Most of them were high schoolers, some were junior hires. Of that group, 71% say that they're hearing voices like a subconscious self is talking to them. Now, do I believe that uh, 7 out of 10 of our Christian young people are psychotic or paranoid schizophrenic? I don't buy that. What I really believe is that there's a battle going on for their mind. And, and when you begin to encounter those kind of experiences, who do you go talk to them about? In our culture, it's just not safe. Think about it for a moment. Would you go in and share with another person that, uh, that you may be having that kind of a battle going on for your mind? Would they accept it? What would they conclude about you? Probably that you are mentally not very stable. And uh, you would probably would be put on antipsychotic medication. I know, because that's the majority of people that I see who've already been diagnosed as such. So more times than not, it remains undetected or unknown. I can't read your mind, you can't read my mind, so I have no idea what's going on in your mind. But this isn't just an adult one, it's a child problem. Uh, little children are having problems like this. We never have a tendency to ask the questions, however. Usually we observe their behavior and try to straighten that out. But the Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. We see the so is he, so what do we try to change? The so is he. And I say, back up a step and find out what's really going on, because the battle is primarily not out there, it's between the ears. The point is, if I could get you to believe a lie, I could control your life. And is that happening? Well, you better believe it's happening in a very, very profound way. We want to share a little bit of what the Word of God has to say about that kind of a problem. I mean, I uh, was called in one time by a friend, and they said, can you talk to my child? Uh, beating up kids in the playground. I sat down with this boy, about six years old. I said, son, do you have thoughts or voices telling you to do that? Well, he was surprised I asked. And please, by the way, he admitted it openly to me. And within about half an hour, just walking through the steps to freedom, those voices were gone. It went right back to a very normal type of a behavior. I remember a lady sat through our conference one time, taught at a Christian school. Uh, her daughter went to that same Christian school, but started to exhibit all kinds of bizarre behavior and the more that they did, the more they tried to correct it, the more they tried to discipline, the worse the problem got. And so she sat through our whole conference, and then she went home and asked for the first time her daughter, Honey, do you ever have, like, thoughts in your mind or, like, voices in your head? Yeah, Mom, four. Now, she openly admitted that. She got with one of our counselors. Within about an hour and a half, she walked out free of that kind of an influence in her life. Now, I know that's hard to accept for some people, but if you've been in my seat for the last several years and just seen person after person struggle with those kind of a problems, the sense is, is that, well, they must really be, be uh, immoral people or whatever. No, no, no. Half of my personal counseling has been uh, to people in full-time ministry. But our young kids, we have to be concerned about that. I mean, consider this scenario for a moment. 
Let's suppose you have about a three or four year old walk into your room and then and, and just cry, Mom, there's something in my room. Now, in our Western world, what would we do? Mom and dad would go in the room, look under the bed in the closet. Honey, there's nothing here. Go back to sleep. Now, you're an adult, folks. If you saw something in that room, would you go back in there and go to sleep? But we have a tendency not to believe the kid. We say, well, it was a late night movie or whatever. I had a music director of a church at the end of the conference come to me and said, thank you. That's exactly what's been happening. My child has been waking up every night for the last three months, claiming there's something in her room, coming in crying to us. And said, uh, we've prayed with her, we've talked with her, but we really didn't believe her. And so really listening through this week, we decided we'd try something different. We sat down and said, honey, you have Jesus in your life. Because you have Jesus in your life, you're bigger than they are. Crouching in childlike terms. And they said, if you see something or hear something like that, you just tell them to get out of there in Jesus' name. Well, a little three-year-old accepts the word of their parents. That night, the child didn't wake up. And so they actually woke up the child the next morning. And her first words were, they came in my room last night and I told them to get out in Jesus' name and they left. <laughs> now, that little child will realize the truth of the word of God, that greater is he that is in her than he that is in the world. And just simply accept the biblical instruction that we are to resist the devil and he will flee from us. There's nothing new here. Nothing new whatsoever. But this problem is old as the Garden of Eden. There's a God of this world. There's a prince of power of the air. And we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. Not believing that doesn't cause it to go away, does it? What I've got to do is just simply believe God as to the nature of the spiritual world we're living in and then learn how, in a truth fashion, to deal with that. Let me give you a, a letter that I got recently that was kind of exciting. We had a major conference in another city. And uh, from a quite different theological persuasion than I happen to hold to, which is kind of exciting about it. But anyway, they wrote me and said, boy, your books are still our bestsellers, and we've walked many people through the steps to freedom. But the story he wanted me to tell is this one. He said, a grandmother contacted us who was having a real struggle with her six-year-old granddaughter. The little girl had made a profession of faith at our Christmas production in mid-December. And until this past Saturday, uh, she had had horrible nightmares every night. The little girl had an imaginary friend from age two to the present. Grandma never thought much of this as the imaginary friend had never done anything harmful or evil. She felt it was rather strange though. The imaginary friend's name was Ganda. And every time Grandma tried to correct the name to Rhonda, the little girl insisted her name was Ganda. Other strange things arose. A couple of examples. Once the little girl said Ganda had gone to the States and wouldn't be back for a few days. Grandma found this real strange, being that the granddaughter was only three years old at the time and had never been to the United States. Another strange incident was when the granddaughter said Gonda was going to have a baby, which she had and kept with her from that point on. When Grandma had Gonda described to her, she was a very beautiful young lady with long hair uh, full of flowers. Being that Gonda had never hurt the child, Grandma didn't know what to do. When I talked to Grandma, I recommended that she read our book, The Seduction of Our Children. She did, and then led her granddaughter through the steps to freedom. Within the week, Gonda was gone. The granddaughter slept through the night. Saturday, for the first time since she confessed Christ, no Gonda, no nightmares, complete peace. Needless to say, the whole family is rejoicing and grateful to the Lord for delivering this six-year-old child from four years of bondage to this demon. Praise God. Now, how much of that is going on? I don't know. I don't know. But we've got to at least ask the questions to find out what is going on. What is happening to a number of our people? In touch with reality? What is real? You know that the Bible asserts that the unseen world is more real than the seen world? That that which is seen is temporal and passing away, but that which is unseen is not as eternal? And so unless we see the world from God's perspective, I don't believe we'll fully understand how we are to deal with that part of reality. It's just a part of reality. We live in a spiritual world. Secondly, relatively free of anxiety. Well, that's a given, folks. The devil roars around like a hungry lion seeking for someone to devour. Why does a lion roar? It paralyzes its prey in fear and then consumes them. The issue behind that is very subtle because if fear is controlling your life, then faith is not. They are mutually exclusive. Let me give you an illustration. Uh, a pastor's wife. This is a very, very mature, educated couple. The wife got sick quite ill, finally diagnosed as pneumonia, wasn't responding to treatment, finally went in and took a liter and a half of fluid out of her lungs, and while they were there, they found a mass of cancer about the size of her fist alongside of her lungs. She immediately went into chemotherapy. I got back from my conference tour, and they called me, and they said, could you talk to my wife? She just phobic, just paranoid. And so I went over there, 
and uh, she wanted to see me alone. I said, all right. So I started to talk to her alone, and uh, she looked at my, her Bible. She said, see that piece of paper hanging out of it? And I said, yes. She said, well, that's a list of who I am in Christ. I heard you talking that before, and I just want you to know that's kept me aboard uh, for these last couple of years. Then she looked at me, this very mature, beautiful Christian human being, said, Neil, I'm not sure I'm a Christian. I said, sweetheart, if you're not a Christian, I'm in deep trouble. I said, why would you think that? Oh, I go to church and I have these blasphemous thoughts. And foul thoughts cross through my mind. Now, people think about this. If she thought that those were her thoughts, what would she conclude about her nature? And if you're facing the possibility of death, would you begin to wonder or not whether or not you're a Christian? Well, that's much of what that is aimed at. Well, with her maturity, about half an hour later, the voices were gone. She went through a year and a half of the most intense physical radiation chemotherapy treatment I think I've ever heard of. Frail to begin with. Doing great, folks. The last I heard, she's got a clean bill of health. But it isn't just her. Uh, you could share that all the way down the ladder. And what's fascinating about this is, is to realize that this isn't a ministry based on Neil Anderson, folks. The Deliverer is Christ. I want to just give you an illustration of that paranoia or that fear and to realize how transferable it is what we're saying. I uh, did a conference for uh, uh, churches across the country this past year, and it was their national convention. And afterwards, the pastor went home and took our material and sat down with a lady in his church. I didn't counsel this lady. He did. Uh, and then she wrote him the letter, but she wanted me, he wanted me to see it. Now listen to this story. Dear pastor, she said, for the past 35 years, I've lived from one surge of adrenaline to the next. My entire life, the portion I can remember, has been gripped by paralyzing fears which seemed to come from nowhere and everywhere, fears which made very little sense to me or anyone else. I invested four years of my life obtaining a degree in psychology, hoping it would enable me to understand and conquer those fears. Psychology only perpetuated my questions and insecurity. Six years of professional counseling offered very little insight and no change in my level of anxiety. After two hospitalizations, trips to the emergency room, repeated EKGs, a visit to the thoracic surgeon, and a battery of other tests, my panic attacks only worsened. By the time I came to see you, full-blown panic attacks had become a daily feature. It has now been three weeks since I've experienced a panic attack. I've gone to the uh, athletic field, church services, played for an entire worship service at a church, waking in the middle of the night, even made it through Sunday school with peace in my heart. I had no idea freedom meant until now. When I came to see you, I had hoped that the truth would set me free, but now I know it has. Friends have told me that even my voice is different. My husband thinks I'm taller. When you live in a constant state of anxiety, most of life passes you by because you are physically, emotionally, mentally unable to focus on anything but the fear which is swallowing you. I could barely read a verse of scripture at one sitting. It was as though someone snatched it away from my mind as soon as it entered. Scripture was such a fog to me I could only hear the verses which spoke of death and punishment. I had actually become afraid to open my Bible. These past weeks, she said, I have spent hours a day in the Word, and it makes sense. The fog is gone. I'm amazed at what I'm able to hear, see, understand, and retain. Before the bondage breaker, I could not say Jesus Christ without my metabolism going berserk. I could refer to the Lord, but with no ill effect. With no ill effect. But whenever I said Jesus Christ, my insides went into orbit. I can now call upon the name of Jesus Christ with peace and confidence. And I do it regularly. You probably didn't need to read this, but I needed to write it down. There's no one else I could share it with. Now you've got to ask, why? Why can't we talk about these issues in our churches, people? The church is the answer to these things. And so if this isn't a place where we can go and bring this to the surface and get it out in the light where we can resolve it, then where can we go? It's my hope that one day when I see another struggling person, I can share what Jesus Christ, the bondage breaker, has done for me and tell them I'm focusing my life on getting to know him. Well, that's exactly what she should do. Well, how many people have anxiety attacks like that or panic disorders? You'd be amazed. In an average place, no matter where I go around the world, when I ask the question, how many have had something like that happen to them? Where you had a, a fear or a panic come over you, Maybe some pressure in your chest. Maybe something grabbing your throat. You tried to say something and couldn't. Do you know what the response is? At least a third of the people, no matter where I go. Don't you think we ought to talk about this, folks? Now, if you went into the secular world and described those symptoms, you would say that you have an anxiety disorder and you probably would be put on medication. 
Now, I believe there are chemical imbalances. I believe we're fearfully and wonderfully made. I believe in the medical practice, but I'm not that kind of a doctor. I really believe the church should assume its own responsibility and not get mad at the rest of the world for not, them not doing it. That's our responsibility, to check out that spiritual side of man and to help them resolve those kind of conflicts. And they're counting on the church to do it because the church is the only pillar in support of that kind of a truth. Well, so here's somebody today uh, basically wondering if they are mentally ill. I can't tell you how many people I've looked at after hearing their stories and say, you are not mentally ill. You're not going crazy. There's a battle going on for your mind. And the response is, oh, praise the Lord. Well, you can imagine. There's hope in that. If there's a battle going on for your mind, could we win that war? Absolutely. Now, let me say something else in terms of mental health. From a Christian perspective, how would we define it? Well, I'd like to suggest to you that from our perspective, mental health should be understood on the basis of two issues. One is, do you have a true knowledge of God, who God really is in your life, and a knowledge of who you are as a child of God? If you knew that God who made you loves you, or went to the cross, died for you, demonstrated his own love for you while you were yet a sinner, Christ died for you, and had gone before you to prepare a place for you, who would never leave you nor forsake you, and then you realize yourself that you are a child of God and that you're in Christ and that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And you had no fear of death. And having no fear of death, you're free to live today uh, with no guilt before God. Would you be a mentally healthy person? Absolutely you would. But let me quickly add that probably the greatest determinant of mental illness is a distorted concept of God and who you are as a child of God. That's why secular counselors oftentimes don't like religion. Do you know why? All their clients are religious. Go into a psych ward someplace. Almost all of them have, have all kinds of bizarre religious notions. Some of them think they're Michael the Archangel or Jesus Christ or whatever. And, and it's fascinating that they, where did you learn that? From your church? No. No, they learned it up here, unfortunately. There's a battle going on for their mind. Now look at that for just a moment because presenting the whole gospel to our people... Most of the people in the Western world have received half a gospel. They understood that Jesus was a Messiah and he came in to die for our sins and we die, we'll go to heaven. Now that's true, but it's only half the gospel. What Jesus came to do is to give me life. The whole problem is, is that you and I were born dead in our trespasses and sin, separated from God. We were in the flesh. What Jesus came to do is to give me life. There's a dead man over here. I wanted to save him. What would I do? Well, give him life. Well, if I gave him life, whatever caused him to die would still be there. No, if you wanted to save him, you'd have to do two things. You'd have to, first of all, cure the disease that caused him to die, which is what? The wages of sin is death. So what did Jesus do? He went to the cross to cure the disease that caused me to die. But folks, that's only half the gospel. You don't celebrate Good Friday, do you necessarily? Well, we do, praise God. But the real issue is, is Easter. It's the resurrection. I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live even if he die. He shall live spiritually even if he dies physically. Eternal life is not something you get when you die. He who has the Son has the life right now. Child of God. You're no longer a sinner. Saved by grace, you're a saint who sins. Having that perspective of who you really are. I don't know about you folks, but I spent about 25 years of my life trying to figure out who God was. Then I spent the next 15 years trying to figure out who in the world I was. You know what I found out from the Word of God? I was a child of God. See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called sons of God, and such we are. We need to have that Abba Father experience in us. When we're done helping a person find their freedom in Christ, there's two things that are true. One is they finally know who they are as a child of God, and secondly, there's a peace that guards their heart and the mind, that path us all understanding. And that's the kind of freedom I think God wants us to have, to know who we are as children of God. Let me give you another illustration of that, just to show you the power of it. I happened to receive this uh, letter from Russia, of all places, and I opened it up and, and uh, started to read it. It was kind of interesting because there was a couple of ribbons that fell out like that with CCCP. That's an antique, folks. Soviet Union doesn't exist anymore. But listen to her story and her testimony. She said, my name is so-and-so. I'm writing in response to reading Victory Over the Darkness. I'm sure you receive many letters, at least I hope you have, because that means people like me have had their eyes open to God's truth. I'm presently living in the Soviet Union. We'll be here uh, throughout this year. We're missionaries. I've been blessed to be able to work in the Ukraine area. Even though I've been a Christian for 21 years, since I was 12, I never understood God's forgiveness and my spiritual inheritance. I've been a bulimic since 1977. I was in Bible college at the time I began this horrible practice. Never thought this living hell would end. 
I've wanted to die, and I would have killed myself had I not thought that was a sin. I felt God had turned his back on me, and I was doomed to hell because I couldn't overcome this sin. I hated myself. I felt like a failure. But the Lord led me to purchase your book and bring it with me. I began reading it last week. I feel like a new Christian, like I've just been born again. My eyes are now open to God's love. I realize I'm a saint who sins, not a sinner. I can finally say I'm free, free of Satan's bondage, and aware now of the lies he's been filling me with. Before, I would confess to God, beg his forgiveness when I binged and purged. Yet the next time I fell deeper into Satan's grasp because I couldn't forgive myself. I couldn't accept God's forgiveness. I always thought the answer lied in drawing closer to God. Yet I went to him in fear, confusion, acting as a sinner who couldn't be loved. No more, she says. Through the scriptures, the way you presented them, I'm no longer a defeated Christian. I don't consider myself a bulimic. I consider myself a saint, salt of the earth, Christ's friend, a slave of righteousness. Food has no power over me. Satan has lost his grip on me. Well, now notice what, what, what transpired there. Was a total transformation of her understanding of who God was and who she was. Those are the most two critical beliefs that you hold. So who are you? Beloved, now you're a child of God. That's who you are. So mental health from God's perspective. A true knowledge of God and who you are as a child of God. In touch with reality. But part of that reality includes the reality of the spiritual world that we're living in. Second clarification that I'd like to look at is the psychological versus the spiritual. Because the most common question I suppose I'm asked by a lot of people, and it's a good one, well, tell me when it's psychological or when it's spiritual. But frankly, I think it's a false dichotomy. Let me illustrate. I personally don't believe our problems are, are never not psychological. There is no time when mind, will, emotions, developmental issues, human uh, personality and responsibilities are not contributing to your rise or to your fall, to the problem or to the answer. Our problems are always in one sense psychological, but our problems are never not spiritual. There is no time when God isn't here, nor is there a time, to my knowledge, when it's safe to take off the armor of God. The possibility of being deceived, accused, and tempted is just a continuous reality. But not accepting that, we have a tendency to polarize into a psychotherapeutic ministry that, that ignores spiritual reality or jump into some kind of a deliverance ministry that ignores developmental issues and human responsibility. I believe neither one is going to adequately explain uh, life and, and the nature of our problems. I think it's going to leave us in bondage either extreme. The tendency for the psychological is try to explain everything from that basis. As though somehow or another I can explain what's going on in your mind but if you don't include the reality of the spiritual world and the fact that Satan can put thoughts there, then somehow or another your explanation of that is going to be inadequate. I really got a fascinating letter some time ago, and, and uh, he scratched off the uh, letterhead on his letter. And I was reading down. He, he explains why in a moment. He says, Dear Dr. Anderson, I've just completed a miracle of total healing and forgiveness of my past through Christ Jesus, my precious Savior. Although I give him the glory and credit, I praise him for leading a good Christian friend to pass me your book, The Bondage Breakers. I began reading it late Sunday night. I've been unable to set it down as I heard the voice of God himself speaking through your written words. This letter is written on my definitely former business letterhead, showing my mistaken belief that the use of hypnotherapy and other so-called therapies now recognized as New Age garbage from Satan could help people to help themselves. Jesus has been causing me to re-examine my involvement in these therapies and utilize your book to precipitate my total renunciation of all these things that are in direct opposition to the things of God. He said, thank you for, for presenting the truth in a way that has broken through my over-educated mind. <laughs> and uh, that is part of our problem. Uh, we're caught up in our own understanding instead of always acknowledging him. Now, the other side is just as bad, people. And when somebody comes up and says, you got a demon of lust. That's not true. If you're struggling with lust, let me tell you why. You may have been abused, or you got caught in pornography, or you were sexually promiscuous, and because of that, you opened the door, and Satan took advantage of it. If you want to get out of it, you're going to have to deal with that first issue responsibly, but you're also going to have to break the spiritual bondage. Because you've used your body as an instrument of unrighteousness, the Bible says in Romans 6, you've allowed sin to reign there. It is ruling there. And to get that person out of that, we have several stories that we share in our book, because there are so many people caught in that kind of sin-confess, 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 oh, I give up cycle. And never wanting to quite get out of there. But that's not the whole picture, folks. It's sin-confess-resist. That's the picture. And somehow or another, 
kind of rejecting both extremes here, dealing holistically with people, recognizing that you are a spiritual being. You're created in the image of God. Well, who is God? God is a spirit. And so there's a spiritual reality of who you and I are. It's hard for our Western world to accept that notion, but people, the Bible clearly asserts it. If you're created in the image of God, you are a spiritual being. Absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. So my primary identification is not this physical body, it's really I who lives within me. It's the real you who is now, if you're a child of God, your soul is in union with God right now, spiritually alive right now. And so I have to reject that polarization. Frankly, I long for the day when Christian uh, counseling, pastoral care that is legitimate can be accepted on two bases. One, do you have a gospel? Is this person here just a product of their past or are they primarily a product of the work of Christ on the cross? Is there a, a realization of the fact that all things have passed away, all things have become new? And secondly, do I have a biblical worldview that takes into account the reality of the spiritual world that we live in? We've got to deal with that as a reality. Let's look at another issue here. The whole area of, of uh, truth versus power. It's not as though they're in opposition to each other because power is an important thing for us as well. But several years ago now, well, about three or four years ago, uh, I made your seminary and, and a man pulled together uh, a conference called uh, Power Evangelism. Now, to be there, you had to be teaching something on the seminary level in terms of spiritual warfare. So it was a rather unique group of people who were invited, to say the least. And uh, the spectrum was quite broad theologically. There was uh, mainline uh, assemblies of God, Pentecostal types, to charismatics, to third waivers, to evangelicals, and all conservative, all Bible-believing people. So it was a, really a healthy interchange. Went on for three days, very formal. It resulted in the book, Rustling with Dark Angels. But here we are, Power Evangelism Symposium, and I'm the last person to present. And I was probably the only one there that was coming at this from a pastoral care perspective. And I remember standing in front of the group, and I said, people, I don't see this as a power encounter. I see it as a truth encounter. I believe it's truth that sets us free. And secondly, I said, I'm afraid we bought our method out of the Gospels instead of the Epistles. Now, the difference is really quite profound, if you think about it. You see, prior to the cross, Satan was not a defeated foe. He was the God of this world. Jesus himself said, the ruler of this world has come, but he has nothing in me. But after the cross, things change. Number one, Satan is defeated. Colossians 2 said he's been disarmed, made a public display of. The Lord has triumphed. Uh, pouring forth of the Holy Spirit was evidence of the fact that he was glorified and he's seated at the right hand of the Father. But prior to the cross, not a defeated foe, to deal with that as a reality, it would take some specially endowed authority agent to deal with that. That's why the apostles and Jesus were able to. But Jesus said to the apostles in Luke chapter 9, verse 1, he said, Behold, I've given you authority and power over demons. First thing he said to the twelve, then send them out. And in Luke chapter 10, when he sent out the 70, when they came back, the first thing they said was, Lord, even the demons are subject to us. And so what caught the eye and the attention of the early church was that reality that still exists to this day. But when you come to the New Testament, you don't see that kind of instruction, or at least the epistles to the church. To my knowledge, there's not a, 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 one instruction in the epistles to the church to cast out demons. So... Many have concluded maybe we shouldn't be doing this. But yes, we can. It's a part of our reality. But there's one major perceptual shift that we have to understand. Not defeated before, but not being defeated, it is no longer the outside agent's responsibility to do that. It's the individual's responsibility. You see, I can't put on the armor of God for you. I can't take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ for you. I can't forgive for you. I can't renounce for you. Confess, I can't really do anything for you. But I can help you. I can assist you. Now I've got a very definitive passage. Right in the pastoral epistles. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24. says, The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, able to teach, patient with wrong, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition. If perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, having come to their senses, that they may escape the snare of the devil, having been held captive to do his will. Now, there it is, folks, but that's not a power model. That's a kind, compassionate, able-to-teach model. That is helping that person assume their responsibilities. And when I was uh, done sharing that, 
one of the leaders suggested, does that work? I said, yeah, it really does. I said, how many of you tried that? And I said, well, really hundreds. And I said, uh, if you look at the picture for a moment, the tendency that we get in certain kind of deliverance ministries is that I, as the pastor, the missionary, maybe the counselor, would somehow call up the demon, possibly get his name and rank, and cast it out. But in that scenario, who's the deliverer? Well, it's the pastor, the missionary, the counselor. Where are they getting their information from? Demons. Let's try another one. I, uh, I want to suggest to you that the deliverer has already come, and that's Christ. And, and I think what God would encourage us to do is to get our information from the Holy Spirit. Now, look at another issue along this line here. Doing it this way, realizing that I've got to get God into the process. It's God who's going to grant repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth that they may come to their senses that the battle is primarily here. Then the critical issue is, is, is somehow or another, let's resolve the issues that this person is struggling with. What is it inside that's creating this kind of a problem? And then you look at a simple order of scripture like James 4, 7, where it says, submit to God, resist the devil. Now, if you just look at that, you got those who are trying to resist the devil without submitting to God. Folks, that's going to be a dog fight. You got others who are helping people submit to God, but they're not resisting the devil. That may leave you in bondage. And you got a whole school of people who aren't doing either one. Well, I think the critical issue is, is really to submit to God and to help that person make the kind of decisions that are going to connect them with God. If it's Christ in you, the hope of glory, then the critical issue is, is that I've got to get you in Christ and complete in Christ. Now, are we not clearly taught that in Scripture? Colossians 1.28, to present every person how? Complete in Christ. So the critical issue is, is to resolve those issues that are important between you and God. Somebody, I think, uh, gave me a beautiful illustration here recently of the kind of process that I'm describing here. It's like we've got sin in our life and see it as garbage. What does garbage do? It attracts flies. And so here come the flies, folks. And so what do we do? We try to chase off the flies. I want to suggest to you that's not what we should do. What we really should do is clean up the garbage. Just clean up the garbage. And the flies won't hang around anymore. There's no reason to be there. But the, if you're focused on trying to resist the devil, then you're not cleaning up the garbage. And what we've got to do is to get that sin out of man and get this person right with God and then you'll have some chance to follow through. Now, in doing that then, it requires you to work with the entire person, dealing with them both psychologically and spiritually. Because most of the problems that they had were really born out of dysfunctional families, bad relationships, sexual abuse or addiction or whatever else. I got a letter here recently from a seminary professor in another school. Never met this guy. And uh, this is what he wrote to me. He said, I've come across your materials a couple months ago and really sense that they express the truth that I've been struggling with concerning Power Encounter. I've been involved with Power Encounter on the mission field and as a teacher here at our seminary. I have really been concerned with the lack of personal involvement of the counselee in this process. I've utilized your materials in counseling situations over the last few weeks with dramatic and powerful results. All of my students in my prayer and evangelism class are reading The Bondage Breaker and going through the steps to freedom. I'm spending uh, personal sessions with those whose bondage is too great for them to deal with on their own with very positive results. I'm ordering additional copies of the Steps to Freedom in Christ guide. The only copy that I have is not going to survive very long, which I'm sure you understand. I have viewed the two-hour video on counseling procedure. We taped a counseling session, and that's what he was watching, which was very typical of the counseling sessions I had used uh, in my own personal work in ministry with people. Now, what's fascinating about that, what I love about it, is the fact that I didn't train this guy. This guy is doing this. And the reason is, is that the Lord is the deliverer. And all i got to do is help this person assume their responsibility. Well, how do we do that? How do we help them do that? Well, in developing our steps to freedom, I mean, what really motivated me a few years ago was to realize that if the critical issue is that they are not connected or united with God or personally intimate with God, then you've got to resolve those issues. Well, what kind of issues would they fall under? Well, I would almost defy somebody that you name the problem, it's going to fall under one of these seven. One is, is deception, obviously, or unforgiveness, which is, I found to be the biggest grounds that Satan has in access to the church today. And Jesus himself says, if you won't forgive from your heart, I'll turn you over to the tormentors. And Paul urges us to forgive, for we're not ignorant of Satan's schemes, devices, thoughts, really, is the word there. 
Uh, pride is a, is a killer of people. God's opposed to the proud. How are you going to be right with God if he's opposed to you? Rebellion is as a sin of divination. Uh, continuous sin, obviously. Make no provision uh, for the flesh, in, in the, for the lust of the flesh. Well, what if you do? What if you do? And then things passed on from one generation to another. And so all we're really doing is helping this person connect with God. Some people say, well, it's too simple. Well, let me respond to something here. I think one of our problems today is that we're in a paralysis of analysis. I mean, I, we're just analyzing people's problems to death, discussing them sometimes for years. I can show you books, three, four hundred pages long, describing certain disorders that people have. They go on and tell you the statistics, the data, the percentages of problems that they have and why they're this way and whatever else. And you get to the end of the book and you go, so, what's the answer? What's the answer, people? Christ is the answer. Truth will set him free. It's the most maddening thing in the world. Now, there's a million ways that you can be abused. The need to forgive is still going to be there. There's a million different ways that you can sin. The answer back is the same. If you were lost in a maze, hopelessly lost in a maze, really, would you want a mazeologist to come along and explain to you all the intricacies of mazes? Would you want a sick fundamentalist preacher to come along and tell you what a jerk you were for getting in there in the first place? What would you want, people? I think you'd want to know the way, the truth, and the life. How do I get out of here? What's the path back? Well, it comes with a deep commitment that the path back has to be to God because he's the answer. I can't set anybody free. I really am not the wonderful counselor, and neither are you. But the wonderful counselor is here, and what we've got to do is get God back into that process. Let me show you that in Scripture. Uh, take your Bibles and turn with me to James chapter 5. I don't know, really, of another specific passage in Scripture that would tell you what to do if you were sick or suffering. Now think about that, really. What do you do? And I want to point out a couple of things in this that sometimes are not very clear to people. Take a look at this. James chapter 5, verse 13. The tendency is to always focus on the oil, and then the effective prayer of a righteous man availeth much. I want to kind of ignore that for a moment and look at three issues. James chapter 5, verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Who's supposed to pray, folks? The person suffering. Now, I'll tell you what, in the earlier parts of my own personal ministry, suffering people would come and see me. Oh, pastor, would you pray for me? Well, what are you going to say? Well, of course I'll pray for you. Uh, but I didn't see much results, to be honest with you. And then it suddenly dawned on me, I said, it really isn't what I do, it's what that person does. That's the critical issue. We believe in the priesthood of believers. All of us have access to God. Uh, I can't pray for you. Now, I can pray in your behalf, but you need to pray. It's just like I can't study for you. Now, I can study and give you a good message, hopefully. But the real critical issue is, is you studying to show yourself to prove? Is you praying with your, your father? Now, you know, it's fascinating because a key pastor in our community brought in this person, sat me uh, and watched as I led this person to freedom in Christ. That was the thing that blew his mind more than anything else. I mean, he just scratched his head. I said, I can't believe it. It's like I've fallen into a trap. Everybody comes in and wants to pray. Oh, so I pray for him. I said, how much results do you see? Well, not much. I said, but the answer is, is them praying. When you see what we're doing in our steps of freedom and what brought these people to freedom in our book, this isn't what Neil Anderson did. It's what God has already done and what they do to get right with God. It's what they do that counts. So if any of you are suffering, let him pray. Then notice the next verse. Is anyone amongst you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Folks, I don't think we're going to see the kind of healing that God wants in his people until we help them assume their responsibility for their own health. We always have this tendency to want to be rescuers and, and assume that responsibility for somebody else. I'll give you the pills. I'll exercise for you. You really can't. To a certain extent, we have to realize, do you want to be well? When Jesus approached the man who was by the pool of Bethesda for a number of years and 38 years or something like that, he asked him either a very profound or a very cruel question. He said, do you want to be well? Now, obviously, it was profound, folks, because truth of the matter is he didn't want to be. He didn't want to be. Well, there are some people who like their sickness, who want to stay in it. Can we help them? Probably not. But we've got to help that person assume that responsibility. If you won't study, if you won't pray, if you won't assume some responsibility, then why is the church spending all that time? Jesus didn't. Now, that is not a cruel statement. 
If I really care for you, I'd have to put that back onto you where it belongs. Because there are certain things you and I can't do for each other. I can't assume that responsibility for you. I do have a responsibility to you, and I'll assume that as best I can. But for you, I can't. I can't. And so if I'm a conscious person, I'll care enough for you to confront you and say, this is a choice you have to make. Well, I don't want to forgive. Well, all right, but I care enough about you to say that'll leave you in bondage. Forgiveness is something you do for your sake. You've got to study. You've got to pray. And then verse 16, it says, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. We focus on the last half of the verse. I said, when does an effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much? And my answer is, after that person has confessed their sin. Now, if you think about that for a moment, why would God want to bring that kind of healing and freedom to our people if that person is stubborn and rebellious and won't answer up to God? I mean, even as a human, I don't think you would particularly do that. But when that person assumes that responsibility, when they are clean, then that's all we're really doing is helping this person face their bitterness or their pride or their unforgiveness. When they've done that, now watch how effective your prayers are. Watch how effective your prayers are. And so you, in the dilemma that I feel that we're in, in the Western world, and recognizing the reality of the spiritual world in which we live in, and understanding the mental health really begins with the true knowledge of God and who you are as a child of God, and that we've got to stop this polarization and start dealing holistically with our people, not in a New Age sense, folks, but in a Christian sense, helping them to assume their responsibility in a loving, compassionate way. And let me just leave you with that last thought because it's a critical one. The Lord said one time in Matthew, he said, you go and learn what this means. I desire compassion, not sacrifice. The kind of people that I've been talking about are deeply hurting people. One ounce of rejection, one criticism, one disparaging remark, and they're gone, people. We're dealing with damaged people, hurt, broken people that desperately are looking for the church to provide that kind of truth and that kind of hope that is Christ in you, the hope of glory, that there is an answer. Frankly, I'll put myself on the line. I think the integrity of the church is at stake. We've been caricaturized and patronized to the point, you can't help these people. I don't believe that's true, folks. I don't believe it's true. I believe Christ is the answer. I believe truth sets people free. I believe that. But if we understand appropriately and know that person how they can enter into that kind of relationship with God and come to terms with that truth that does liberate, does set us free. But I think the best Christmas present that I've received in a long time, I got just this past Christmas, there was a gal who was so badly abused in her past that I couldn't even talk to her without my wife being present for a number of times. Just because of the fact that the number of men who had treated her so horribly, and she's far beyond that right now, but she wrote this out and sent it to me for Christmas this past year. And I want to share it with you because I think it is profoundly uh, powerful in the sense of what the role of the church should be today. And this is her story. She said, while on vacation as a child one year, I happened upon a gold watch that I had noticed was lying on the ground. It was covered with dirt and gravel and was face down in the parking lot of our motel. At first glance, it did not seem worth the effort to bend down and pick it up. But for some reason, I found myself reaching for it anyway. The crystal was broken. The watch band was gone. There was moisture on the dial. From all appearances, there was no logical reason to believe this watch would still work. Every indication was that its next stop would be the trash can. Those in my family who were with me at the time laughed at me for picking it up. My mother even scolded me for holding such a dirty object that was so obviously destroyed. As I reached for the winding stem, my brother made comment as to my lack of intelligence. Been run over by cars, he chided. Nothing could endure that kind of treatment. As I turned the stem, the second hand of the watch began to move. My family was wrong. Truly, odds were against the watch working. But there was one thing no one thought of. No matter how broken the outside was, if the inside was not damaged, it would still run. And indeed, it did keep perfect time. This watch was made to keep time. Its outside appearance had nothing to do with the purpose for which it was designed. Although the appearance was damaged, the inside was untouched and in perfect condition. Twenty-five years later, I still have that watch. I take it out every once in a while and wind it up. still works. She put it in a bag and brought it and showed it to me one day. She said, I think as long as the inside remains untouched, it always will. However, 
unless I had bothered to pick it up and try to wind it years ago, I never would have known the part of the watch that really mattered was still in perfect condition. Although it looks like a piece of junk, it will always be a treasure to me because I looked beyond the outside appearance and believed in what really mattered, its ability to function in the manner for which it was created. Here's a hard part. Thank you, Neil and Joanne, for making the effort to pick up the watch and turn the stem. You're helping me to see that my emotions may be damaged, but my soul is still in perfect condition. And that is what was created to be with Christ, the only permanent part, the part that really matters. I know that deep within my heart, no matter what my feelings are telling me, this is true. I also believe that with the help of God's servant, even the casing can be repaired, and maybe even that will become functional again. People, it's the church's role to pick up the watch and turn the stem. They are desperately looking to us for an answer. And I believe it's Christ. And I believe that truth will set us free. Thank you.